The body of an American religious foundress was found to be miraculously incorrupt four years after her death. What does this mean and what might God be telling us through this? We're going to talk to somebody who knows the community well and recently visited Sister Wilhelmina's body. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before I get started, just want to encourage people to smash that like button and to subscribe to the channel. And also, you can follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. Okay, so today we have Andy Flattery, who has been on the podcast before on a completely different subject. He is the uh, owner of Simple Wealth Planning of Kansas City and the host of the Reform Financial Advisor podcast. But we're not going to talk about any of that today. In fact, I'll make sure there's a link to our podcast where we do talk about that for anybody who's interested. Most importantly for today, he's well acquainted with the Benedictine Sisters of Mary, Queen of the Apostles, and has very recently visited them, as well as the incorrupt body of Sister Wil Wilhelmina. Welcome to the program, Andy. Eric, always a joy to speak with you, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great. Um, I was so excited when I saw your tweet that said you had been there. I was like, oh, I got to talk to somebody who's been there, mm -hmm. and uh, because this is this is very exciting. I, in fact, I was thinking about it, and there's a lot of stuff in the news, in the Catholic news world, you know, with the the um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence being honored by the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. We have DeSantis announcing for presidency this week, all this stuff going on. And in my mind, this is the most important news story in, in America, maybe the world right now, because this is something that is miraculous, literally Thank miraculous. You. It's really a, a message from God in a lot of ways. So I, I just for people who might not have any idea what we're talking about, we're going to get into it detail. But just the really quick version is simply that a religious order uh, of sisters in uh, Missouri they were moving the body of their foundress who died four years ago. And instead of it just being bones, they, the body was still a uh, preserved essentially. And what Catholics would call incorrupt. And so that's, that's the basic story. Now we're going to get into detail. Some. So first of all, Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, sister Wilhelmina herself? Like who, who in the world is this, was this person? Okay. Yeah. So sis, sister Wilhelmina, she didn't come out of anywhere. Um, in fact, when, when I was up at the Abbey on Sunday, I picked up this book that they put, put out, put out. And, uh, it's a beautiful book that they put the, the, the sisters put together after her death. It's called God's will. And I've been sort of paging through it here over the last couple of days. And she did indeed live a very saintly life. Um, sister Wilhelmina had been a, um, she had been a, uh, a, a nun her entire life. Um, and uh, at the age of 20, she, she essentially joined a religious order um, after having grown up in a devout black Catholic family in St. Louis. And so um, throughout her life, she, um, she was, uh, she exhibited very, very, uh, the qualities of a very, a very saintly woman. I think she had at least two visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her, her oldest memory was a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary at, at age two. Um, I think when she was like nine years old or something like that, the book recounts at her first communion, she felt a calling to be a bride of Christ and to, to be a religious sister. And what had happened was um, she was uh, from a very pious family and um, had always had a respect for the liturgy, for Gregorian chant. But in the in the in the 60s and 70s, her order was starting to move away from that tradition and they were like moving away from the habit. I think at one time they moved from the traditional habit to some sort of like um, toned down version of the habit or I don't know what the right terminology is, but. After her father died, she went home. She went back to St. Louis to visit her mother. And when her mother saw sister in the stripped down version of the habit, she said, I'm, I'm so glad your father didn't see you like this. Wow. After that, sister put back, put, put back on the traditional habit and she wore it for the rest of her life. In fact, she was required to make it herself because she couldn't find anyone that was still making the traditional habit. There's an anecdote about how she used some sort of plastic jug or something like that to make the, uh, the headpiece. Um, so that is her story in, um, in 1995, she had a calling to start a new a religious order of traditional nuns. She had gone back to the Latin mass, I believe like in the eighties and nineties. And then in 2006, that religious order um, came under the, um, uh, under the, the diocese of Kansas city, Missouri, Bishop Finn um, uh, 
basically brought him into that was praying for order of sisters to come to the diocese. They've been here since, since 2006 and are now named the Benedictines of Mary queen of the apostles. And, um, the, uh, the sort of fruits of it are here to speak for themselves. They're a remarkable order. Um, you can, they're sort of number one on Spotify for like the Gregorian chant, which they do at every mass and it's awesome. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I think um, what, one of the reasons for my belief in this miracle is is knowing that she did live a saintly life. It, it sort of adds up. And, um, you know, if, if what I'm hearing from the sisters in the Abbey is that they weren't surprised at all. In fact, maybe they were even sort of expecting that this sort of miracle might happen with her body. So that's what wow. I was. That's amazing. So now there's some connection with the fraternity of St. Peter. And do you know what, like, didn't like when the order first, she first started ordered, wasn't it through them or something like that? Do you know the details of that? Like, yeah, they, they, they were, um, their charism is certainly, I think probably still aligned with the FSSP. And that was the, um, that was the idea, I think in 1995. And I, I'm not the right person to ask of all of this, but my understanding was there was some disagreement early on about. Um, what kind of order it was going to be, if it was going to be some sort of cloistered order or, or something else. And um, it had a really sort of um, tumultuous um, beginning. And uh, I, I think uh, to, to Sister Wilhelmina's credit, she was in poor health for like the last couple decades of her life. She persevered throughout decades of like this order coming together and going through various, um, various leaders and until finally coming to their, their final resting place in Gower, Missouri. So I think um, I'm not the right person to ask as to how that transition happened, but they did find a home at, in, in the diocese of Casey Mo, which is where they are today. Okay. So they, um, so do they, so basically though, they're a traditional order. Do they celebrate both? Do you know, do you celebrate both those or in traditional Latin mass or is it mostly just traditional Latin mass? Like when you've been there, has it always been the traditional Latin mass? Yeah, it's exclusively the traditional Latin mass. Okay. Um, however, their, their chaplain is a diocesan priest who celebrates their traditional Latin mass. So I think they use, I believe it's the 1962 missile okay. and that is indeed part of their charism. And sister Wilhelmina was a staunch defender of the traditional Latin mass. Oh, wow. Okay. Amazing. But they're, mm -hmm. but the, the diocese is, is kind of who they're connected with right now, right? Just the, the Kansas city, Missouri diocese. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are, um, the, their novitiate was created underneath Bishop Finn, which was the, um, who's a bishop, bishop back in 2006. And, uh, they are under the, um, they're, they're underneath the diocese of Casey Mo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now she died in 2019. In fact, I just, before we started recording this podcast, I saw that at, over our sister publication, One Peter Five, there is a beautiful article on her funeral that the, the mass just kind of reflecting on a traditional Latin mass funeral. It's it's a bit different than uh, the, 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 the Catholic funeral today under the Novus Ordo and just reflecting on how beautiful it is on, on her life and things like that. So I'll link to in fact, I'm going to write that down to link to that um, as well so people can read that. So essentially, though, she started this up. Uh, in the 19, 1995, when she was about 70, and then she died in 2019. Now, you went there uh, a few months ago and recorded a podcast. In fact, this is how I kind of first realized about them. I'd heard of the music, but I never could remember who it was, who did the, you know, which, which it was. Yeah. But then you did a podcast where you interviewed them, and it was great. And I'll link to that definitely um, because I, I remember listening. It was great. So tell us about kind of what led you to even – go there in the first place to interview them, especially since you were on a, you, you, you host a financial advisor podcast. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think part of the, the appeal is, um, I mean, it's really, if you, if you go to this place, the, the Abbey of Ephesus is what it's called. Um, in Gower, it really is like a pilgrimage. And so for me living in the Kansas city Metro, it's 45 minutes from where we're at. They, they have a schedule of prayer and they welcome pilgrims to go and join in prayer. Um, the uh, um, they are indeed cloistered nuns, so they're not going to like fraternize with you. They're going to go about their schedule of work and pray, but you're welcome to go there and and pray with them. And so, um, part of my interest was just pure curiosity, and um, the, an interesting way that they were able to build the the Abbey of Ephesus was years back. There was a um, 
a couple of gener generous benefactors that were like, hey, we know you guys have a need in this church to um, to get this thing built. We know you don't want to go, go into debt. Can we gift you some appreciated Bitcoin that we have? <laughs> So, so I've been told everybody who knows me and knows you, it's like immediately like, okay, this is why Eric's in, in, interested in this now. It's yeah, a Bitcoin yeah. angle, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's the connection there. And you might think, well, what, what is the connection with some, I mean, they really are traditional Benedictine sisters sort of in every sense, but I think there is sort of like a universal appeal for these sisters. Um, they have support from all over the world. They have, um, they have sisters from several countries around the world that come to join this order. And these are young women that come to join this order. Um, so I think maybe there's a benefit there that you can have, like they have a, bit, a public a bit Bitcoin address on their website where you can, you can send, um, you can send a donation to. Well, I am so sending them one as soon as we get off now that you tell them. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. And so I think these, you know, these, these sisters, they're sort of, um, um, they have the, um, the can do attitude of like, let's get this done and let's embrace this technology if it's going to help us. And so that has been something that they've done over the last several years. And so that is how I made the connection. They have a chaplain who's, who's really into it. He's um, he's what you'd call orange pilled. And, um, and then the uh, mother Cecilia, she, she gets it too. She's the mother superior of the, of the Abbey. And so that's how I found out about it. And, uh, but I thought the really it, by the way, I thought it was a wonderful evangelization effort by you as well because your podcast is obviously not about catholic stuff right. it's about just financial uh advice and things like that and but yet in the podcast it was just a great witness to these beautiful sisters um so i encourage people to listen to that because it was because people who are listening to your podcast aren't necessarily catholic even and but they get to hear this witness now who did you interview for the podcast was it mo the mother superior I interviewed Mother Cecilia, Cecilia, and I and I had the sense that she's sort of the, the spokes, she's sort of the spokesperson, and really it's hard to really interview any of them. So it was sort of a blessing to be able to, to speak with her, and uh, and she was terrific. But I mean, what really happened was when I went up there with that sort of background, um, I was just completely um, inspired by the just being around these remarkable sisters. Um, I mean, even just the look of it is. Um, is totally opposite of what we expect to see out of uh, women in our culture. And um, I don't know if I'd ever really seen a traditional nun in the habit um, in, in that sense. So um, the uh, they exhibit uh, simplicity and joy in everything that they do. And I think that was part of Sister Wilhelmina's character. And um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to make an effort to bring my whole family up. And my wife said the same thing. Um, it really is an inspiring thing to make a pilgrimage up there. And I would recommend anyone that has a chance to do it. Um, they should, especially with this news now. Yeah. So, OK, so you how, how large is the is the or do you know about how many uh, okay. sisters there are there? I want to say there's something like 48 sisters because they're maxed out of this abbey in gower they're actually building another one in southern missouri right now because they're sort of at capacity i think it's like 48 or something like that okay okay and and from what you could see was it mostly younger women uh who are part who are sisters in it it's hard to see you know they were, they were yeah. in the habit but, That's but true. It, 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 it very much looks like it's you know young women um tw 20 something women i think Mother Cecilia is probably still in her 30s. She's the oh, mother wow. superior, at least that's what she looks like. Right. And um, it, it very much seems like we, we, we chatted with a, a family that had flown in on Sunday from Virginia. And um, it was a woman who herself wasn't very old, but her daughter was 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 um, being sworn into the order. And oh, wow. uh, they traveled across the country just to visit Sister Wilhelmina um, on Sunday. So um that's yeah, that's my that's my perception of it. Okay, and and I will say it's it, it, it's kind of funny you said that because when you see these beautiful nuns in their habits and stuff, they are kind of ageless. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, you you can kind of tell, but really, a, a woman could be sixty and she looks like she's in her thirties or something like that. And, and and so yeah, it is it is wonderful when you see them now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit then about um, visiting recently. Now, first of all, just for people who might not understand what it means when Catholics say we uh, bodies incorrupt is typically what, and this has happened in the past 
where what happens is a body gets ex exhumed for some reason. Uh, maybe it's being transferred to another location or whatever the case may be. And instead of the normal decay that a body would go through, a dead body, a corpse goes through, where typically after four years, uh, you're basically just going to be bones. Uh, what would happen is, is that on some level, the body is incorrupt. And this can be different for each situation. Like sometimes it's like just the hand is incorrupt or some part of the body. Sometimes it's the whole body. And it doesn't mean that the body is in perfect condition like it was alive. It just means that the natural processes of corruption did not happen, uh, at least not as they should have. And so this is often seen as a sign by Catholics when this happens of, a sign from God that this person's life was in some sense uh, one to emulate that, that because we all as Catholics, we believe that sin corrupts and sin brings about death. And so when you have a body, and, and of course the most, the, the, the best example of a truly incorrupt body would be the blessed Virgin Mary, because she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. But there's a little bit of that in any of these incorrupt bodies because it's kind of like a way of saying this person wasn't as corrupted by sin as the rest of us uh, at the very least. So I just wanted to give that primer for people who are listening to, so we understand. So now you visited uh, the, after, and I, 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 from what I understand, in fact, I have some pictures I'll, I'll, I'll here, I want to pull up here um, for those who are, are listening. Hold on a second. Let me just, I got to do something here. Um, those who are listening or just have to bear with us. So there is a, a picture of her body. Uh, as you can tell, it's not like it. You can tell, obviously, this is a person who's passed away, but this does not look like a body that's been uh, that's four years in the grave. And I, I if I understand it, uh, actually, there was a there was a crack or something in her tomb. And so uh, it should have been even worse because there have been different um you know, air and things like that would have corrupted it even faster. Now, here's another. Uh, let me pull up another one here. This is a picture I just found online. Uh, looks very, now, is that first one I, I showed this one? Is this one? Did you take this one? You know, that was my, my sister-in-law, Maria. I want to give credit to her. She okay. took this. I'm one of these people. It's too cool to take pictures. And then I, I leave. I was like, man, I should have taken some pictures. But uh, yeah, credit to my sister. That's a very, yeah, that one's a very good picture. Um, uh, and this is one of her that the sisters released, I believe, um, of their around of them around her body. And then and this is the one you put up on Twitter. And on this one is uh, who is that your family there or is that somebody other family? Yeah, that, that was um, another another uh, pilgrim from Lawrence, Kansas that we were chatting with. Okay. But um, that's me um, kneeling and my, my son, Henry, who I made sure to put his hand on the body of Very sister nice. as well too, which by the way, was amazed me. I couldn't believe that they were allowing us to do that. I know. Which I think is part of the reason why you might've noticed they, they, they put like a wax coating on right. our skin, which I think is maybe like some sort of best practice or something like that. Right. That was one of the questions that I had, but, um, but yeah, I and mean, I, there was a I, long, long line of, um, of um, people just coming up to be able to pray and, and put their hands on what I think is probably a saint at this point. Yeah. Um, well, God thinks that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the the um, I think I just read before we went on. I believe on May 29th they are going to move the body then into a glass case. So if you're going to be one of the few people, because only people until then are the ones who could actually touch your body. Because after that, because I, I just don't think you can do that permanently um, for obvious reasons. So uh, yeah, I just think and this so this one that's you in the picture, correct? Uh, that's her. That that's, that's me and my, and my son Henry. My my wife was able to come up to and and uh, and place a rosary on the body of sister. And um, oh wow, it's that's uh great. it's remarkable. I'm I'm told that those are the clothes that she was buried in, and the uh, the socks are immaculately preserved, which is one of the things that the sisters were most amazed about. Um, if you look at the picture of her face, there's a the shape of her eyeball is still there. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that one of the sisters, um, this is, you know, it's a little grotesque, but I think that's kind of the point actually, actually peered in and glanced to see that the whites of the eyes were still there. And indeed they were, which is remarkable. Um, but, uh, and, and she's just out in, in, uh, in the aisle, um, sitting next to the faithful out in the open, as you can see here, just like this, my, uh, there's a, there's a, a balcony right above this image that you can sit in and, and my, 
my two boys, ages four and two, were sitting during mass on the rails of the balcony, looking out over the, the, the body of, of Sister Wilhelmina. And um, one of the amazing things about it is my, my wife remarked like that is as good as they've ever been in mass. And um, wow. And they really were like, we, we're one of these, we go to, um, we're not Latin mass people. I've probably been to maybe 10 Latin masses my entire life. We go to the so-called unicorn novus ordo and indeed, um, taking my kids to the Latin mass for the first time, they were, um, so well behaved, but sitting above this, um, this incorrupt sister, um, in the balcony of the church was really cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more. So uh, first of all, how old's your, uh, how old's your son? The one who touched her? He's two. He's two. Okay. He, the thing is you, you're going to tell him about that and he's going to be, I mean, that's just going to be a, a big deal, obviously uh, for his entire life. And then you say your, your wife put a rosary on, on her. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's now a third class relic, of course. Right. Well, so, yeah. technically she's not a saint, but it will be a third class. I relic. think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So tell us just a little bit about why you were there, kind of the atmosphere, the, who was there, kind of what was, what was going on when you were there? The place was full, but it was very peaceful. Um, I saw license plates from all over the country. The uh, There's not a huge parking lot or anything like that, like you see in a lot of churches. In fact, a couple of the paths to get up to the church are just like dirt paths. Um, and so the uh, there, there's no like... Um, Oh, big entrance way. So many of the people were just congregated out in the, the yard outside the church, um, just speaking with, with, with each other, um, congregating kids playing that sort of thing. So it was very, very, uh, peaceful. And, um, my understanding is that's picked up over the last couple of days. Now that's getting more media attention, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you had cars, um, as I was driving up from, from, from Kansas city, there's a line of cars that I'm behind to get out there. There's cars parked on the, on the gravel road out in the country, but it very much is out in the country. It's a bit of a hike to get to. And, um, you know, you have, you have all stripes. It was certainly what you'd call, I suppose, the Latin mass crowd um, with, um, you know, the, the women in veils and the mantillas. But I, I think very probably 90 percent of the families that we saw there, I think I saw one or two that I knew from Kansas City, but there's a lot of faces I think were just traveling from all over. But like under age 40, um, young families, young people under age 40, I imagine by that by the time I was there on Sunday, I think it was still pretty much all word of mouth. It hadn't really gone to the media yet. It was just sort of a whisper um, network of, of people finding out about this and um yeah, very peaceful, very, um, uh, very, very exciting. And I think um, just a lot of, of faithful pilgrims that were coming to try to see um, uh, an incorruptible for maybe the only time in their life. I don't know how many American incorruptibles there are, but certainly um, to potentially sit next to and touch a, a, a black Catholic saint who did great things in her life and now is an incorruptible. It's, um, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I believe I read she's the first African American to be incorruptible. Incorruptible. Okay. So uh, that's pretty. And I just think that's, I think it's part of the amazing story about her is that she she was born in 1925 or 20 or something like that, 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so she experienced. Uh, I mean, America before desegregation really had kicked in. I mean, St. Louis would have been kind of a a border town in, in a sense, I would guess. Um, and I believe uh, I read somewhere that, you know, she definitely experienced discrimination when she was younger, but it didn't really, uh, she didn't become bitter from it. She didn't become uh, angry and like that. She just uh, offered it up. And, and so it, it just, uh, you know, in today's world where there's a lot of race baiting and things like that, I just think there's a message there too that this beautiful African-American woman who, who experienced racism, actual racism back in when she was younger, she, she, uh, she, she was still able to just maintain her, her faith in God and, and, and you know, and just love for, and love for others. And I think that's, that's another beautiful message is, do you know, uh, I obviously didn't meet every, every one of the sisters. You said the sisters come from other countries as well. Is there, I mean, is there any other African Americans? Do you know in the order or any other country, anything like that? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly, um, but but you, there are you know there are dark darker skinned sisters, um, 
in the congregation. I don't know exactly where, where they right. come from, if it's St. Louis or if it's somewhere else, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it really is, um, a really remarkable story for that community. What I, what I read was the history there was, um, you know, St. Louis is a, has French Catholic origins, um, in like the late 18th century, there was slavery that came to that city and a sister Wilhelmina had an ancestor that was a slave working for a French Catholic. And this ancestor of hers converted to Catholicism. And there was a quote in the book about how when that happened, the owner of, of this ancestor said, I, I, I have to free you because for me to keep you in slavery is like keeping Christ in slavery. So that is how she comes from a, a many generations of Catholics. And, um, and so, yeah, like, like you mentioned, and she grew up experiencing prejudice, um, both from blacks who said that she was part of the white church, going to the white church from people in the church that didn't support the ministry to the blacks. I think there was a, some Jesuits that to their credit were doing a great job of ministering to the blacks and creating a lot of, con um, so sister Wilhelmina's mother created like something like hundred converts in her life. She's from a, a, a wow. remarkable family in that regard. But one of the striking things about what she said was that, yes, she, she saw prejudice in her life, but she also didn't think the answer was to change the faith for, for the blacks. Like she was, she protested like an, the idea of like an African-American liturgy um, after Vatican II. I think she tried to use like gospel in the mass gospel music, which is what she was instructed to do. She later ditched it and said like, that's not going to make more people show up to, to mass and be reverent and went back to the Gregorian chant. So um, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful um, testament there. Yeah, it really is. I, I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm very struck by this story. I admit because it just seems to be of God's way of sending us a message that we need to hear on multiple fronts. I mean, that's the thing is like she, uh, being African American, uh, loving the the traditional Latin Mass, all these different fronts, that, being a nun, um, all that. So now the sisters. What is there? I, I don't think we ever covered. I just want to make sure we understand. They, they obviously have this music that they produce. What is their actual charism? Are they cloistered? Do they have an active ministry? W what is their charism? Yeah, I think the idea is they call it the Abbey of Ephesus, and they're modeled after Mary when she was living with the apostles um, after Christ was risen. And so um, they, they pray for priests they, uh, I believe they make vestments for priests and their sort of charism is in support of priests. And, um, and so I think that is part of the uh, authentic femininity that they display as part of their charism is that they, they, they're there to pray for, for, for these, these men. And, um, that's another very beautiful thing. That's sort of counterculture to, um, yeah. to the modern world. And very much needed. I mean, we have a crisis of vocations, of course, in the church and, uh, you know, so, so few people responding to it. So the fact that they're praying for and priests are under such serious attack mm -hmm. today, um, have their prayers, I'm, I'm sure are very powerful. So, okay. So is there anything else that we need to know, um, that we, that we haven't covered about these sisters, about sister Phil, uh, Phil, I almost said Philomena, sister Wilhelmina, um, or anything else that you, you know about them that we need to know? There probably is, um, and I'm maybe missing it at this point, but, um, you know, I, 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 um, I, you know, I, I posted some, I posted a few things on Twitter and, you know, I, I knew exactly what the, what some of the response was going to be. Uh, there, there's going to be some people that, that see the headlines here or see this in the media and they're just immediately going to think that it's bizarre and, yeah. and that they're, they're not going to have any sort of belief in this and just think that, you know, we're, we're bizarre for having any sort of faith in this story. And I, I would say I totally understand that. Now, part of the reason for my belief is I am Catholic and I recognize that, that we have this um, heritage in our Catholic church of the incorruptibles, but also knowing her story as a, as a, um, one who lived a life of, of um, a saintly life. And then having my own experience of traveling to the monastery, uh, seeing the faith of these sisters and seeing the, the body, the body of, of the incorrupt sister Wilhelmina, um, is, is the reason for my belief. And, um, 
And I know I think there's some people that it's it's too weird and too bizarre and too morbid, but that's sort of the, the point for me. You know, it's like it's kind of like the the Flannery O'Connor thing about um like the medieval grotesque or whatever it was that she was sort of sort of gravitated towards with with Catholicism. Like to me, this is sort of like a link to our medieval Catholic heritage. Um, I think it's a big deal for American Catholicism that we have a traditional nun who, you know, wore the traditional habit, went to the Latin mass, was an advocate for the Gregorian chant. And now she's an incorruptible. Like it's a link to, it's a link to our past that I, I don't know if personally, I don't have any, any personal connection to something like that in my sort of American uh, Catholic tradition. So that's what makes me very excited. Yeah. That, that's beautiful because I, I think you're right that obviously America does not have a very deep Catholic history. I mean, that's just kind of the way things are. And there are a few examples like the North American martyrs and some others, but really we don't have that deep tradition, that connection to the old world, so to speak, as much as maybe we should. And this is like, I agree, this is a connection to that. And I remember as a Protestant, I would have thought this was super weird. Right. And just like, oh my gosh, those Catholics are doing that. And there's a lot of maybe good intention Catholics who kind of want to lean away from this stuff because they don't want to uh, offend Protestants or, or, or non-Catholics. I say we lean into it <laughs> because yes. I mean, this is, I think this is part of when you look at in the whole perspective of all of Catholicism, this is part of the incarnational nature of our faith that God became man in order that we might be like him. And so our bodies are very important. In fact, that's one of the things the incorruptible is pointing to is that we will receive our bodies again one day, either in heaven or hell, you're going to get your body back. And so the idea of the resurrected body that we get our bodies back, this is a, a sign pointing. Obviously the blessed Virgin is the biggest sign of that outside of Christ himself, of course, but these incorruptibles are another sign of that, that, Hey, your body does matter. It's part of who you are. It's, it's important. And so I think all of those things, um, and just it, it's a way of God just kind of showing his favor that, yes, this this woman live. It was a woman after his own heart and that he he rewarded that. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's beautiful. So I'm going to put links to everything. I feel like I wrote a bunch, bunch of stuff down. Uh, you mentioned can you mention her um, biography again? I think you had it there. What, what is it? What is it called? You know, I bet this is on their website. I, I bought it when I was there, but it's called God's Will, The Life and Works of Sister Mary Wilhelmina, Foundress of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of the Apostles. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's beautifully done. I think um, people should read this book to get the, the backstory, which is going to um, sort of bring home the idea as to why she is, I think, probably a saint. Um and yeah, um, I, I bought the book yesterday off of their cool. website. They are selling. They said it will be available at the earliest, like mid June. I can imagine they've sold out very quickly and they're, they're rushing to print some more. Um, but I, I bought it. It was like 20 bucks or something. And you, you cannot find it on Amazon or I, I looked there just to see, I wasn't going to buy it there because I don't want to buy it from Amazon. But, but the point is, is that at their website, which I will link to, you can buy it, but obviously I'm sure there's a back order at this point uh, of people buying it because uh, everybody wants to read it. Um, so yeah, so I, I'll put a link to that. I'll put a link to the, the sister's website, uh, a link to the podcast where you interviewed them. Cause I think that's a great um, kind of basis for understanding their order um, and all this other stuff. I'll put it all in there. So Thank you, Andy, very much for coming on. I appreciate this. Um, I, I think it's just gr a great story. I, I just hope we can uh, help a little bit to get the the, the message of of what's happening um, there out out to the world. Yeah, praise be to God. Yeah, so God bless you, and uh, until next time, God love you and Sister uh, Wilhelmina. Pray for us.